This podcast was recorded and provided by the National Association of Regional Councils. For more information about NARC, please visit narc.org. Hello, everyone. This is Mia Colson with the National Association of Regional Councils. As part of the U.S. Department of Energy Sunshot Solar Outreach Partnership, we are working with our partners at the International City County Management Association, the American Planning Association, and ICLE Local Governments for Sustainability to support local governments in increasing solar deployment in their communities nationwide. Today I'm joined by Stacy Richards, Director of the Energy Resource Center at CETA Council of Governments in Lewisburg, Pennsylvania. Stacy has extensive public policy and program development experience at the federal, state, and local levels, including as a member of the White House staff and as Deputy Secretary for Pollution Prevention and Compliance Assistant with the Pennsylvania Department of Environmental Protection. Stacy launched CETACOG's Energy Resource Center in 2005 to foster Central Pennsylvania's development as a center for efficient and renewable energy technology and expertise. She's joined us today to talk about her experience advising municipal officials and local ownership of solar in rural America. Thanks for joining us today, Stacy. My pleasure. Thank you, Mia. So can you start with giving us a little background on CETACOG and the role that it plays in the region? Yes. CETACOG serves an 11-county, primarily rural region in central Pennsylvania. Our region stretches from the northern edge of Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, northward about 175 miles along the Susquehanna River. And our region's breadth spans from west of State College to Berwick in Columbia County on the western edge of the Poconos. CETACOG is a public organization, was established in 1957, and it focuses on increasing the economic resiliency of our region's communities, businesses, local governments, and residents. So we're unique in that our clients are everyone within the region, public and private. CETACOG is an economic development agency for the region and one of seven local partners in Pennsylvania to the Federal Appalachian Regional Commission. While we provide individual technical assistance to all of our clients, our role as a regional organization enables us to identify challenges and opportunities to develop and deliver programs that systemically meet the needs of our region. What I mean by that is that we can often procure financing to design and deliver strategic programs and projects that help many rather than just one community or one business. Great. Well, let's start off by talking about CETACOG's Energy Resource Center. Can you give us a background and overview of it? Yes. As in many rural areas, we created the Energy Resource Center in 2005 because the majority of our region's public and private facility managers were generally aware that they might be spending more than they needed to on energy. But what they lacked was the knowledge of the steps necessary to reduce their operating costs by reducing their energy use, and also ways to replace their energy use of conventional fuels with renewable energy sourced locally. Because there was no collective demand, like real market, for energy reduction expertise in our region, our region lacked the supply chain of engineers, the architects, the material suppliers, the contractors and investors needed to cost effectively deliver these energy related products and expertise. So we set out to change this. Thanks to funding from the state and the Federal Appalachian Regional Commission, for several years the Energy Resource Center provided monthly breakfast seminars focused on energy. Several thousand senior managers from about 800 organizations attended these seminars. Our seminars created the demand for energy reduction and renewable energy materials and expertise through education. The seminars provided a platform for facility managers and the construction trades to connect with each other and to collectively learn about high performance buildings, best energy reduction practices and materials, renewable energy technology, and how to finance these. We also partnered with our local workforce investment board to provide energy reduction training to the construction trades and to facility operators. We procured grants to reduce the, these training costs. 
we now have in our region a growing critical mass of LEED certified architects and engineers, certified energy assessors, materials providers, skilled commercial and residential contractors. Organizations have invested millions of dollars in energy efficiency and renewable energy projects that have reduced their energy consumption and costs. And as importantly, new businesses have been created to meet the growing demand. This is what I view as local economic resiliency, as well as creating and recirculating new wealth within the region. So the, that's our education that, that, that has been very useful, but also the Energy Resource Center's individualized technical assistance is primarily focused on assisting our municipalities to reduce their energy use. Our smaller municipalities, like many in rural America, lack the in-house capacity to understand the complex ways that they use energy, how much they use, how much it costs, and how to reduce it. So to help them, we provide utility bill analyses for municipalities, elected officials, and senior staff. And we assist them to procure qualified energy assessors that identify and recommend energy reduction investments that are based on payback. Every municipal client so far has invested in energy reduction measures. We also provide that utility bill analysis spreadsheet and the charts to each municipal client so that they can track the efforts and the effects of the investments they make and to manage their energy use and investments going forward. After assisting our clients use less energy, we then help them to invest in renewable energy projects. We always begin with energy conservation, then move to renewables, because that sequence provides far greater savings than simply installing renewables without first reducing energy use. Since the barriers to greater energy independence are the same for residents, businesses, and institutions, and my program's resources are limited, we expanded from individual technical assistance to collective assistance a couple of years ago. We just completed a three-year project, largely funded again by the Appalachian Regional Commission, that assisted an entire community in our region to gain greater energy independence. We helped them to identify how the entire community uses energy, how much it used, and then we targeted technical assistance to residents, businesses, and institutions to help them to reduce their consumption and then invest in community-based renewable energy. We designed this project to be replicable by other communities, and I'm right now in the process of writing the how-to manual for use by other communities to also gain greater energy independence from conventional fuels. So that's, uh, in a nutshell, what the Energy Resource Center has been focused on for the last couple of years. It's been a lot of fun, it's been challenging, and like so many things, we have scratched the surface. So can renewable energies improve the economic landscape for rural America? Oh, without question it can. But we need some new policies and investment tools, or at least tweak those that we currently have in place. Um, we just need something different than what we're using now. I believe that our biggest opportunity to gain greater local economic resiliency is with distributed solar. By that I mean solar projects that are locally owned and they locally source the energy and they use that energy. Um, solar is perfect for this. So let's talk a minute about the mechanics uh, and the value of solar technology since that is the topic of, 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 of our presentation. The feedstock of solar is all over the world. It's free. It renews itself daily. You don't have to worry that this resource, is, this resource will run out or increase in price due to scarcity as you do with other uh, renewable energy feedstocks. And then once installed, the solar arrays have very little maintenance costs and no emissions that require permits. Their feedstock, the sun, has no transportation or processing costs. Uh, there are no waste from the process of producing electricity from the sun. It's just a neat little package. Um, in fact, solar panels are simply little manufacturing plants that require a, a location to create electricity. 
they're ideal for rooftops. Because they last for 20 to 25 years, they need to be placed at locations that have long-term ownership. So ideal sites for solar arrays are the rooftops of many local government and community buildings. And these facilities are in turn ideal to use the electricity produ that's produced on site. There's much to like about solar energy. However, in our rush to deploy solar, policymakers are assuming that all buildings are now energy efficient. Many of us have been preaching and teaching about energy efficiency for 20, 25 years now. And many of our large organizations, both public and private, government and, and private sector, have invested in energy efficient buildings. In large measure, that's because larger organizations have had the internal resources to recognize energy efficiency's economic value. But the vast majority of rural America, especially small municipalities, have not yet made the investment or behavioral changes to reduce their energy use. That's a problem. Municipalities in particular are like small universities or large universities. They use energy in many ways. Buildings, street lights, traffic lights, ball fields and, and park lights, wastewater treatment plants, water treatment and water supply facilities. Municipalities have, on average, 45 energy bills to pay every month, but often little understanding of what they're paying for, how they are using energy and what it's costing them. They because the elected officials and senior management lack the internal staff resources to figure out how and where to reduce their energy costs, if they don't know these energy use details, they are likely not prepared to strike a good deal regarding renewable energy investments when they're proposed to them. One deal in particular concerns me. A few years ago, lucrative renewable energy federal tax credits became available that have spawned power purchase agreements that are too often economically harming rather than helping municipalities. These power purchase agreements are precluding many municipalities from realizing the significant savings through investments in cost-effective energy reduction opportunities. That's my big problem with them. The power purchase agreements are often providing false promise to municipalities of greatly reduced energy costs. Smaller municipalities think they're getting a good deal and too many just simply are not. Under a power purchase agreement, the outside investor provides the solar array at no cost to the municipality. The municipality agrees to buy the electricity generated by the solar arrays at a price that is only, usually, slightly less than the market rate, which on average increases 3.5% annually. Thanks to the generous tax breaks that reduce their capital costs, the investors, the power purchase agreement providers, who own the solar arrays can produce this electricity at a very cheap levelized cost of 3 to 7 cents per kilowatt hour but they sell the electricity produced by the arrays at a far higher price to the municipality. But most importantly, by promising reduced energy costs at no capital cost to the municipality, the power purchase agreements remove the incentive for municipalities to reduce their energy costs by investing in energy reduction. A kilowatt not used is the cheapest way to reduce energy costs. We all know this. It's the cheapest, fastest way to reduce costs. It doesn't mean it's necessarily the easiest. Too many municipalities are simply dazzled by the offer of lower electricity costs at no capital expense. So they skip right over the greatest opportunity to reduce their energy costs by simply using less energy instead. They opt for the power purchase agreement. I have a case study on our website that literally illustrates the economic value to municipalities of investing first in energy reduction, then investing in solar energy. The scenarios include owning solar as well as using the electricity produced through a power purchase agreement. The numbers are startling and they're instructive. While the graphs on the website are worth a thousand words, 
I'd like to walk you through the process and the results. In 2008, the Energy Resource Center provided a utility bill analysis for Loyal Sock Township, a community of about 11,000 residents on the outskirts of Williamsport, Pennsylvania in Lycoming County. The utility bill analysis we conducted revealed high electricity baseload and seasonal energy spikes at the municipal building. This indicated that the building's envelope was leaking conditioned air in both the summer and winter months. A $500 energy assessment that we procured for the township recommended a lighting retrofit inside the building and air sealing around windows and doors plus adding insulation in the attic. The net cost for these measures was $6,000. This $6,000 investment which reduce the building's energy consumption by 54% will save the municipality $103,000 over 30 years. Payback for these investments was less than two years. The energy assessment also revealed that if a 17.5 kilowatt solar array was placed on the building's rooftop, the annual electricity consumption of that building would be almost zero. Looking for a project in our region that would showcase the economic value of both energy reduction and renewable energy, the Federal Appalachian Regional Commission agreed to provide a $40,000 grant to Loyal Sock Township toward the cost of the solar array on their roof, but only if the township first invested in the recommended energy reduction measures. With the grant and the selling of the solar renewable energy credits that the township owned because it owned the solar array, the net capital cost to the municipality of the solar array was about $70,000. The solar array is reducing the building's electricity cost by an additional 24%. However, due to the capital cost of the solar array, Loyal Sock will save an only a net $37,000 over the 30-year life of the solar array. With the solar array and the energy conservation investments, Loyal Sock will cumulatively save $140,000. Of that $140,000, $103,000 of it is the savings they achieved by the kilowatts no longer needed to be used. And that that is why I believe that the power purchase agreements are just not being favorable to a lot of municipalities. They just need extra help to be able to invest in, identify and invest in those energy reductions. If Loyal Sock had opted to enter into a power purchase agreement to reduce their electric costs, they would have had a solar system in place on the rooftop, just as they do now. They would have had to purchase every kilowatt the array produced. They wouldn't have owned the system. They would have had to request permission from the outside investor to make changes to their building, including any energy investments, energy reduction investments. And here's the kicker. Their savings would have amounted to less than $10,000 over 30 years through that power purchase agreement. Now, how could the savings be so minimal when Loyal Sock Township would be getting a price break from the solar array investor? Well, it's because the township would be paying for 54% more electricity than it needed to, and at ever-increasing electricity prices over time. And that is, that is what is not well understood about power purchase agreements. They are requiring the purchase of electricity at, yes, a reduced rate, but they still need to buy that electricity year after year after year as the price climbs. Well, thank you for highlighting that case study. It really is a great resource, and I encourage everyone to check it out. So what are some of the other benefits of renewable energy investment? Well, other local resiliency benefits of distributed renewable energy, the, what I mean by that is locally owned, locally used energy, are many. When the solar storage technology is available, distributed energy projects will greatly enhance local emergency response and national security by providing the local power needed when the centralized grid is not functioning. 
This includes not just natural disasters or nuisance electricity outages, but also homeland security. Also, maintaining our centralized electricity grid is expensive. Distributed energy can relieve the burden we place on our electricity grid to generate enough electricity we will ever need to use at any one time. That is the situation that we have now. We have ever-increasing em eminent domain, the upgrade and addition of transmission lines. As our appetite for electricity increases, it's a requirement by the, our grid work, our electric grid, to provide enough power to cover our greatest demand need. When they're not able to do that, we experience very expensive brownouts, often in large metropolitan regions. That's expensive. Distributed energy, by taking some of the demand off our central grid, can lower um, the cost of maintaining that grid. Uh, by just relieving the amount of electricity that's required. Instead, it's being produced locally. And increasing the solar market in the United States will contribute to the technology's advancement worldwide, which is a good thing and can lead to lower prices. Last but not least, and probably not last, but last uh, for, for the points I want to make, distributed renewable energy creates and then recirculates wealth within a region through the growth of a local network of project developers, engineers, contractors, material suppliers, investors, and of course, the owners of the system. In your opinion, what is the best financing option available for rural local governments looking to install solar? Well, currently, um, only entities with tax liability can take advantage of those federal renewable energy tax credits that I believe contributed to the increase in power purchase agreement. These financial instruments are not accessible to tax-exempt organizations who own the very buildings where solar placement is most appropriate. Um, and we do not have good dedicated financing for um, tax-exempt entities as we do for the private sector, both large and small businesses, at least not here in Pennsylvania and not, not very much at the federal level. Uh, instead, there are competitive grants that are out there, but everybody gets to compete for them, and particularly smaller municipalities or smaller organizations are uh, handicapped because they just don't have the internal resources like larger organizations do uh, of grant writing capability. And so often, while they may apply for the grants, they don't win them. So they, are, they, are, they do not have the access to capital that they need. So we need our federal and state policies and renewable energy financing tools to be more egalitarian and more focused on the economic resiliency value of a couple of things. Distributed energy, which I've talked about, it provides the opportunity to expand and benefit from community-owned renewable energy projects where the financing could be happening from local investors in the solar systems themselves. And then also expansion of microgrid systems that serve communities rather than current centralized electricity grid. These are, all, these are opportunities that are not well understood but should be explored. Also, local ownership financed by municipalities of solar, financed by strong renewable energy credit markets, is a better approach, in my opinion, than the power purchase agreements. The renewable energy credits are egalitarian. Both public and private sectors qualify for capital. Um, they need, once they've installed the solar, um, SRECs, renewable energy credits, aren't competitive grants. And Community net metering is another good uh, uh, option for financing and policy. Um, net metering, community net metering, allows a project owner to share the project's electricity output and thereby share the, pro share the cost. And then much more simplified security laws in order to make community-based projects easier. Right now, they're complex to put together, and they don't have to be. Lastly, smarter federal tax incentives. Nonprofits, cooperatives, cities and counties are logical entities to build projects. So what do you think needs to change? 
Well, I talked about a couple of things, so so let me let me sum up. We need to level the financial playing field to include tax exempt organizations' access to both energy efficiency and renewable energy capital. We need um, throughout the United States a, a cultural policy financial shift away from valuing only centralized energy delivery and recognizing the many benefits and perhaps greater benefits of distributed energy and a microgrid system. Uh, we need a significantly greater general awareness about the cost benefits of solar production and the same with awareness of municipal leaders of the value of their solar resource siting and production potential. And finally, it's important that we shift policy at all levels away from the simply using rural America's renewable energy feedstock, which is what occurs now, and our open space. And we need to shift that to supporting rural economic resiliency via energy efficiency and renewable energy. Uh, so much of the United States is rural America. Uh, when we facilitate their resiliency, we facilitate the resiliency of the entire country. The Institute for Local Self-Reliance, headed up by David Morris, have written several excellent articles about the economics of, of local resiliency, and particularly uh, uh, as it relates to energy use going forward. Uh, I encourage anybody to tap into that website and those publications. I refer to them constantly as I look to bring change into our region that is affecting, really positively, affecting local, local economic resilience. Great. Well, thank you so much, Stacey. It's been wonderful talking with you today, and you provided a fantastic overview of how renewable energy can really bolster rural America's landscape. And I encourage everyone to check out CETA COG's website, www.ceda-cog.org forward slash energy to find comprehensive information on how rural communities can develop efficient, renewable, sustainable community energy. And you can also find out more about the Sunshot Solar Outreach Partnerships work at narc.org forward slash solar OPS. Thank you so much, and I'll see you next time. Thank you for listening. For more information about NARC, please visit narc.org.